Did you know that there's actually a golden Buddha statue in Missouri? I'm not talking like a little one that sits on like a desk or a shelf. No, it's a big, giant Buddha statue in Missouri. It's actually about 20 minutes away from here. If you were to head down to Columbia and get off on Old Highway 63, take about two minute drive, and there's a gigantic golden Buddha statue in someone's front yard. But that's already weird enough, but what makes it weirder to me is right next to it are like three Christian crosses. So I'm confused. How does this guy have a gigantic golden Buddha statue, but yet at the same time have three stereotypical Christian crosses? It's very confusing, and he has left his life very unclear. We can't tell by looking at that yard what he believes, who he follows. Because Buddha and God don't go together. I feel like we can do that sometimes, make our life unclear on who we follow. But thankfully, the Bible shows us many people who made it very clear on who they follow and who they believe. And I want to look at a story that most people have heard if you grew up in the church, or even if you've been in the church for the last two years. We're going to talk about King Nebuchadnezzar here. Really about, as the Shells put it, Rack, Shack, and Benny. Actual names, Radshack, Meshack, and Abednego. Shadrach, sorry. So here we go. We have King Nebuchadnezzar. He just built a 90 cubic high by 9 cubic wide golden statue. I mean, this thing is huge. And he expected everyone to sit there. And when the music of a horn, flute, zither, lyre, or harp would go off, everyone was to bow down to the statue and worship his gods. So he assembles everyone and everyone has explained this new law that you must bow down when you hear the music. The music goes off and everyone bows, but three people, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Some people that are higher up see them not bowing down. And so they go to King Nebuchadnezzar and they say, hey, King, did you not command everyone to bow down when the music went off? and Worship your gods? Of course he did. So they say, well, Radshach, Meshach, and Abednego, Shadrach, sorry, vegetables really mess me up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego aren't bowing down. So King Nebuchadnezzar does what most kings would do in the situation, has him brought to him. It says, is it true that you guys do not bow down to my statue and worship my gods? Because you see, I have commanded you, that is what you must do. When the music of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, or harp goes off, you must bow down and worship my image I have set for you. If you do not, you will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Then what God will save you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I picture them taking a deep breath, collecting their thoughts, and look at King Nebuchadnezzar and say, Majesty, I will not bow down and worship your gods. For my God is strong enough and mighty enough that he will save me from your hands. But if he doesn't, I will still worship him. So Nebuchadnezzar rage, throws him in the furnace. Eventually someone sits there and goes, King, didn't you throw three in the furnace? And it's like, yes. Well, there's four. So as it finishes out, God shows up, saves Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they live a prosperous life afterwards. But I want to focus on what we don't typically focus on in that story. Usually we look at God saving the three. I want to focus on what they did. You see, we kind of brush over their choice of response. They looked right at the king and said, I know I might die for what I'm about to say, but it's not going to stop me. Like, I will worship God, period. Whatever it costs me, that is what I'll do. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were a bold confessor. They were living life boldly to proclaim God, no matter what it did to them, what it cost them, what they had to lose. They were going to be a bold confessor. We must be a bold confessor. Confess boldly. Always. 
Confess boldly always. You see, when I read this story, it makes me think of a story I read in a book called Jesus Freaks. I love the name. I think it's hilarious, but it gets the point across. And one of the stories in that book is about a young maidservant named Rucken. You see, in the 16th century, Philip II sent a duke down. <clears throat> well, sent a duke down to stamp out the Protestants who refuse to not study the Bible in their own language. So the Inquisitor goes down and he starts searching the mayor's house of Berg. And eventually they find a Bible in there. And so the mayor's family, one by one, is being questioned. What's with this Bible? Why is it here? And all of them don't know why it's here. Have no idea. Eventually, the young maidservant Reckon is pulled out and asked. And she proudly says, that's mine. I'm reading it. Well, the mayor immediately, because he really likes this girl, tries to cover up for her. And like, no, no, no. She's not saying that she's reading it. She just has it, and it just sits on the shelf and collects dust. She doesn't actually read it. Well, Reckon won't have it. She will not let lies save her. And so she sits there knowing that the penalty is either drowning, hanging, suffocation, being torn to pieces, or burned alive at the stake. She knows these are the penalties, but she says, no, that's mine, and I study it, and it is the most precious thing I have ever owned. The most precious thing to me is this Bible. You see, Reckon wasn't going to let a lie cover up. The threat of death deter her from living her life for Christ. One day she is standing at, she has been punished to suffocation. Suffocation at the time was they would take a section of the wall, hollow it out. They tie you up in it and seal the wall back up. So she's sitting there, standing at this wall, ready to go into her tomb. And the guard is sitting there and he's, they're like, okay, got another chance. Just say you don't read it. Say it's not yours and we can go on. He says such a young and beautiful girl yet to die. She won't back off. She says, my God died for me. I will die for him. So they tie her up in there and they start sealing her off and eventually, the guard once again looks at her and says, Are you sure? You will suffocate and die here. Her response is, I will be with Jesus. Finally, it's almost done and there's just one brick left. It's just enough to just see her face. They're like, this is your last chance. Repent from this and move on. And all she has to say is, Oh Lord, forgive my murderers. They sealed her in. Later on, many years later, the bones were dug out of the wall and buried into the cemetery of Berg. You see, she was a bold confessor. Confess boldly, no matter what. She was willing to take her life for God. Now, I'm pretty sure none of us here are worried about losing our life for our faith. What is that commitment God wants? He wants us to say, that's the commitment I have. And if persecution comes out tomorrow, I would be willing to die for you. See, there will be times in your life where you will be tempted to hide your faith. You'll be tempted to bury it down. When we were younger, a lot of the times it was because we didn't want to be that kid that didn't have anyone to sit with at the lunch table. Or we didn't want to be excluded from the basketball team. Or we didn't want to be kicked out of my friends who do D&D. No one wanted to be kicked out. Whatever that reason was as a kid, we didn't want to be 
exiled. And you know the sad fact is, still today, as we get older, that is still an underlining feature that is one of our greatest weakness as Christians. We like to be liked. And sometimes when you're at work, you do what that takes. When you're around your other friends who might also claim to be Christians, you do what it takes most of the time to follow in. No one wants to be the outcast. And so what we do is we decide to turn our back on being a bull confessor and confessing boldly. And we hide. We're no longer that person willing to die for Christ no matter what. I want to leave you off. First off is what I'm going to challenge you today. I'm going to challenge you to go out through this week and look back on your life. It could be just this last week or farther. And find that moment you retreated. Then proceed to ask yourself, if you were in that same situation today, would you do the same? And be honest. It's a tough question to ask, and it's very easy for all of us to say, no, no, no. I'd be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'd die. But would you? It's a deep personal question you can only answer yourself. That's what I want to challenge you with. But I want to leave you off with a quote by a guy named Eric Luddy. He says, as a basic premise of my Christianity, I will respect the God-given authority in my life. But if that God-given authority goes against the God authority in my life, I will say no, no matter the cost. He's saying, I'll respect those who are in charge until they go against my God. Then I have to draw my, the line in the sand, put my feet down, and say no. So what's it going to be? Are we going to retreat back into our shell and hide? Or are we going to confess boldly, no matter what? 